if I were to sit down with, say, um, an evangelical Christian, uh, or, say, a Wahhabist Muslim or something, and explain my point of view and explain my sort of philosophical outlook to that person, I think that there's a fairly good chance that that person would misinterpret what I'm trying to say, or they would um, they would be worried about the implications of what I'm saying. You know, they would be worried. Okay, you're talking. You know, you're kind of saying that Satanism might be under certain circumstances. Okay, you're kind of saying that horrific, um, the horrors of the universe can be loved. Um, Hmm, that's kind of scary because look where that kind of might lead us. That might lead us to you know you being one of the people in charge in Dante's Inferno. Um, now I'm not going to take the fifth here on this. I'm not going to sort of say look, I what I believe is my own business and I don't owe you any explanation. I'm going to voluntarily walk into the witness stand there and submit myself for cross examination and I'd say I see what you're saying and I understand that this. That, that the point of view that I'm putting forth could be used. Um, you could switch around the positioning of the cart and the horse and say that this could be used to sort of rationalize or justify some pretty horrible behaviors. Or one could attempt to use it in that way. I understand that. Um, I understand what I understand that objection because you have to sort of. You have to sort of detect early signs, right? When you're, if if your if your view of time is strictly a continuum and not sort of a dot, then you have to detect early signs of when there might be some harm, and you might be tempted to sort of take a preemptive strike or whatever, um, and that might not be unreasonable, because you know you you hear about cases of people being overheard uh, discussing things like. Um, I don't know, blowing up a train station, some terrorist or whatever, and the police catch wind of this, but the, he hasn't actually done anything or said anything that they can actually arrest the guy for. There's no conspiracy to actually do it. You're still going to be on some sort of a watch list uh, forever. They're, they're, they're just going to say, this guy is suspect. We're going to brand him right on the forehead with the big S that says he is a suspect person because of the opinions that we've heard him espouse. Therefore, he is dangerous. Um, I think that that would happen, and I don't think that it would be totally unreasonable of that person to do it. Um, because there are a lot of people who take ideas like occultism or Satanism or even um, Tantra, and they sort of use it for things that I'm I have no interest in, in doing. Um, uh, there always were religious cults in India of Kali worshippers who did some pretty nasty things. That word thug comes from that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, they're equally, there are plenty of vegetarian observant Hindus who are into Tantra. They usually keep it quiet, who never do anything. And in fact, they, they probably do less than I do, even though they live, breathe, and exist in a Tantric sort of state. Um, they even hold themselves aloof from even discussing it, um, which I don't do. And, and, and in fact, I'm not. I'm more of a dabbler compared to such people. Would you say that those people are dangerous? Because um, they're not even trying to spread the idea around. They're just sort of looking at the universe in a certain way. They're looking at existence in a certain way. That's all. And that's all that I that I. Um, see my sort of philosophical aim as is to alter my view of things. Um, in Mendham said that um, you can manipulate reality to make the bad look good or something along those lines, and I'm not interested in doing that. I'm not interested in doing that at all. I'm uh, not trying to do what I always accuse Walter Kurtz of in Apocalypse Now, of trying to sort of make the bad into the good and make the good into the bad. Weakness is bad, strength is good, you know, this kind of thing. Um, as opposed to being somewhat value neutral, I guess, at least in terms of the way you're trying to get yourself to think. Because, you you know, there's 
there is that thing about, as I say, early warning signs on the continuum. Well, there are, there, there seems to be nothing but early warning signs when you're sitting here in the stream of becoming. There's nothing but this could go wrong. This could go wrong down the road. This could be a, a problem. This could be a harm. This could be an issue. This could be a problem. This could, wow, where could this lead? Okay, now that's, if, if you want to look into the stream of existence that way, into the face of existence that way, what, you, what you're going to get is horror and anxiety, and you're warned specifically that that is a risk that you're running. Because when you see things as they really are, if you stop and think about how fragile our own existence is, and perhaps even, as Nietzsche said, when contemplating the idea of eternal recurrence, which in, in my view of things is just a means of confronting the brute fact of our own existence as one of the few things we can actually be sure of, that can horrify you. Um, <clears throat> but how do you do that? How do you do that sort of transvaluation of things? Like once you sort of see existence for what it is and you opt to love it, okay, well, you're loving Auschwitz in a certain sense, or you're loving the fact that you exist in a universe where there are Auschwitzes. Uh, you, you love the, your own fate for having placed you in this position where you have to view all of this. It's not a huge stretch, and it's not a, a, a baseless objection to say, this guy actually likes this kind of thing. He's sort of saying he wants to love all this. He, this is easy, easily misconstrued, and it's very easy to take a hostile view of it. Um, and I'm not saying that all hostile views of it are insincere or deliberately strawmanning either. Because somebody may sincerely believe that what you've got is a dangerous idea. I always harp on self-discipline for that very reason. I always harp on keeping a reasonably good reputation for being a moral person or whatever. Um, and not because your reputation really is, an, is important as an end in itself, i.e. keeping up with the Joneses or whatever, but just so people know that you're no real threat to the social order. Here we go again. The, um, the social order is, you know, something that will defend itself against people who actually look like they're getting ready to throw a monkey wrench into the works. So you've got to kind of play along with everything when you're when you're being this sort of, you're thinking this far out of, out of every conceivable box, because you're always going to face people who either deliberately or sort of innocently, and I would say most people do it innocently, misunderstand what you're saying. Um, it takes courage, in other words. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be laughed at, which is, again, I'm the kind of person, the more people laugh at me, I, I, I just laugh along with them. Um, but the people believe that you're going to take your inner point of view and impose it upon the outer reality, which is not what I'm advocating and which I do not believe um, real tantric schools actually teach. Now, we, you know, we can get into the no true Scotsman thing there, what's a real tantric uh, point of view, but... From my perspective, it's simply a way of seeing that which is necessary. It's a way of it's you know it's a way of putting I guess Nietzsche's Amor Fati into practice. If something is necessary, if something is inevitable, why stand up against it? And that there's there's a difference between saying if something is inevitable, why not why why waste your energy standing up to it to well, the triumph of nasty stuff is inevitable, so why not join the nasty side, i.e. Walter Kurtz? It's a fine line there, isn't it? That's why, you know, you're always told that when you engage in these practices, there's all kinds of pratfalls along the way that, you know, you might get sucked into, you know, and the obvious case of life affirmation turning into something rather insane is the way that Nietzsche's words were used by the Nazis to, you know, promote their view of things when, you know, becomes obvious after a while that okay, I can see how you could do this, but that's not what he's saying at all. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of what he's saying. Um, because, you know, you sort of use it selectively. You manipulate what he actually said as opposed to actually taking the whole thing as an entire canvas and saying this is what he means, and you negate one part of it and you alter the whole thing. Um, 
you know, the obvious objection to, I guess, the case of the Nazis is Nietzsche would have dismissed those huge crowds of people at the Nuremberg rally as a mindless herd who just, and he would have dismissed the guy haranguing that herd as just some idiot who just wants to herd sheep. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not, it, it may look, it may be easy to char mischaracterize it that way, and you, you are running that risk. People have always ran that risk. Now, I, I, I run the risk of being mischaracterized and misunderstood, and I don't care. I'm one in a million, I think, in, in that regard. I truly, it, it, it's not even a rebellious thing. Um, I don't care if people look at me and are horrified by what I'm saying, and I don't care if people think just, you know, they just laugh at me when I say what I'm saying, which is actually the far, by far the more common response. But I do get the occasional, you know, people calling me evil or whatever. Uh, well, okay, then that's fine. If that's if that's the price, you know, of of telling it like it is, I guess, or telling it the way I see it, then so be it. You know, again, I'm no price is uh, too high for the uh, the ability of owning oneself. Um. So yeah, I, I but but you know, I understand though. Your 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 life is almost you know in this kind of a situation, your life is almost an endless fending off of misrepresentations of what you're doing. And I accept that. That's how it's going to be. You know, it, it's, you know, if you're discouraged by that, then don't get involved in it. If you're discouraged by the idea of going to your grave, having everybody you've ever met laugh at you and mischaracterize what you're saying innocently without really meaning to mischaracterize it. If you're, if you're put off by that, don't follow this point of view. It's very simple because that's what people are going to do. Um, I can only say it so many times. Well, no, I can say it as many times as necessary. I'm not talking about any outer manipulation to make the bad into the good. Bad and good or good and evil don't even come into it here. It's just a way of seeing that which is necessary, that which is, that which is inevitable. Um, but people are going to see it other ways. And people who style themselves tantrics because they don't really understand the ideas, or people who style themselves occultists, or whatever you want to call that kind of thing, who may actually believe that there's this thing called uh, some spirit out there, or whatever, or ghosts, or whatever, they may actually believe all of this. Well, that's, you know, again, that's, that's not me, but they're going to use my language to actually, you know, or they're going to use similar language to me, and I might get swept up in that. Well, there's nothing I can do about that, and I accept that as a risk. Amor Fati again, right? I accept it because that's just my fate to live in a situation in which I may be wildly misunderstood. Okay, well, nothing I can do about that. It's out of my hands. Move on. If it happens, it happens. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, you, you have to be careful with this because people will extrapolate stuff that really is not what you intend. And... And they may do so sincerely because they say, well, if we take what you say and plot it on a graph and we can say, look where this is going, yeah, you can do that. And you can say, yes, it could go that way. But I would say when you're looking into the stream of becoming, everything is ultimately like that. Everything. The fact that I've raised this pen in the air could have set off a chain reaction that ends up in the creation of a super virus that, you know, causes untold misery for eons. I, I really like science fiction uh, when they deal with that, the butterfly effect and how crazy it all can get. Everything, everything can have a negative reaction down the line. And again, this is kind of the Jane way of viewing karma. All action is pointless, and all action is ultimately dangerous. Um, the only thing to do is to just say, I don't accept this anymore, I'm leaving. I bow out completely. Fair enough. Um, I'm not saying that that's an invalid way of looking at things. Um, do it then. I won't stop you. Just what I would tell such people is when you, I might look at you and say, I get it while you're doing that. I don't think that it's out of line to sort of say, could you perhaps afford me the same courtesy? I get why you're existing thinking that way, and why you've opted to take, say, the course that a Jane would take of Salikana, sitting down and 
letting yourself waste away to death. Um, the, I get it. I see why you're doing that. I see if I had your axioms, I would probably come up with the same conclusion. I don't share your axioms. And it's not that I think that your point of view is wrong. It's just the base assumptions are not mine.